What's up, everybody? This is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews for completed games that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. How many times have we heard that RTS games just can't be done well on a console? Many, but then along came Halo Wars in 2009, and, well, it changed some people's minds, but not everyone. But of course, in rides Microsoft with a new developer, Creative Assembly, replacing the storied folks at Ensemble, and we now have ourselves Halo Wars 2 for the Xbox One and PC. Let's see how it did, shall we? As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Halo Wars 2. Learned futility of sending warthogs against hunters, finding out that Spartans aren't Spartan special anymore, and Lord of the Halos. Graphics are up first. Honestly, seeing Halo Wars 2 in action is proof positive that locked 30 FPS needs to be a minimum on these games, dropping below its target 30 FPS on the console occasionally, especially when a large number of units jump into particular sections is actually a bit disappointing, and it really never feels all that stable. Now, the PC version wasn't ready for a review, basically going live for reviewers and gamers at pretty much the same time, so this is based on the console version. Now, one thing that's noticeable is that the game does have a very slick presentation with a heavy use of post-processing, dynamic lighting, and artistic expression to sort of make you feel like you're in the midst of the Halo universe, which also includes absolutely stellar color work. This also results in a distinctly organic look to everything, and while aliasing can be seen on some straight lines, it's obvious that Creative Assembly has done their best to alleviate what they can. Sadly, while map makeup is at times fantastic with huge jumps where hogs fly over and massive orbital bombardment lasers, ignoring the fact that they're basically vaporizing life-giving ozone layer by layer, Texture work does suffer from some lack of detail, especially in specific areas like beach areas, which look frankly Botoxed of most texture detail, even when zooming straight in. Other than that, I would say the game looks pretty okay. One thing though, when you take a couple groups of Banshees against some ground to air units and watch that firefight envelope the screen in ever growing explosive circles of human marshmallow cook-offs, it's actually pretty damn hard not to feel a bit like you're down close in the game world itself, if your world ran in fits and starts at 30 FPS. As a package, while held up by some great processing effects, really cool unit details, excellent design, and some interesting maps, the game does show some weaknesses, both in texture detail and in holding a steady FPS throughout. Sound, music, and voice. Our base is under attack. All units. Local units. See you back at the mess. I'm under assault from enemy infantry. Yes, sir. Yeah. Wiping out. All units. As I suspected. Security measures would advance without us. But it is coming through on a UNSC frequency. This is good. When we left, the war wasn't going well. The signal means the UNSC is still fighting, or maybe we even won. What's the source of the transmission? We don't have the surface details yet, sir. And of course, sound is always going to be up first. It's phenomenal. This is how you do it for an RTS. The sound absolutely works to inform the gamer of what's going on from the distant rattle of machine gun fire just off the screen to your left as your friends die to the explosion of your scorpion just off screen that you foolishly faced off against the wrong kind of foe. The sound really is just stupendous. Everything's clear and layered so that even if you have six different troop types all jockeying to see who can send more enemies into the great unknown the quickest, you can actually tell which units are there pretty much by sound alone music. And this is actually pretty good. Gordy Hab, Brian White, and Brian Trifon have done a good job evoking the Halo feel while not exactly copying piece for piece other numbers from other games. Incredibly smart instrument choice means that the moment the title music starts to soar up, you actually know it's a Halo game, though it is far more somber, I think, than we're used to, while battle music sways more towards the percussion and driving beat that I think we would all expect in combat. Overall, no real complaints, but it doesn't really elevate itself. Voice. Yeah, so I get it, it is an RTS, but this is all over the place. While the main commander, who's voiced by Gideon Emery, does a really good job eliciting a feeling of this in-line duty of respect, regardless of the situation, Erica Soto, as Isabel, and many of the other side characters are nowhere near as believable, and it's most evident in mission loading screens, where briefings are done by folks trying their best to mimic Walter Cronkite. That being said, when you're on the battlefield, unit updates, warnings, threats, and bravado are actually done very well, and if you listen closely, they're highly informative, as folks who can't attack certain units may scream, I need jump jets to take on this guy, and that kind of thing. It's done well, and since it's the majority of the game, it's good when it actually matters. I think in one way, this game is missing one thing, and that's presence, because aside from the big baddie who is like a walking image of menace in alien form, no one really knocks it out of the park when it comes to personality. 
gameplay. So of course, as always, we start a bit about the story. The game takes place 28 years after Halo Wars 1 and a bit after Halo 5. The human war against the Covenant's pretty much over and your ship, the Spirit of Fire, was presumed destroyed, but you're really just taking a note from the Master Chief and sleeping until someone wakes you. And boom, they are now awoken. Near an Ark and finding a solitary new AI there, they find out that a brute warlord known as Atriox has basically risen to power. And it's up to the Spirit of Fire and its seemingly inexhaustible legion of men to conga line their way to death and hopefully have the enemy run out of bullets before they run out of conscripts. Now, the campaign is 10 plus missions and fully playable in co-op, with missions taking anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour and a half per. Now, most of them have you set down in a specific goal in mind and have you possibly building bases and hiding the multiplayer aspects of Halo Wars 2 behind the story moments with you under various time limits to destroy particular locations or save friendly units. Now, if you're new to this, combat in Halo Wars is, as always, based somewhat on rock, paper, scissors. Ground vehicles trump most infantry, infantry chew up aircraft, and aircraft are effective against vehicles. But all units have various upgrades that can make them a little bit more deadly, and sometimes it's somewhat of a soft counter against units they might originally have not done so great against. Gameplay is based around collecting energy and materials to build items at your base. Now, energy can be collected from collectors on the game levels, and materials can be collected from items around the game world while both can also be generated at your home base by building their supply buildings. Unfortunately, even as somebody who loved Halo Wars 1, Halo Wars 2 has the same issue, and that's a good deal of the flexibility of many RTSs simply is not here due to the difficulty of control. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't work well at times. You can use the digital pad and allows you to jump to forces in order around the map, as well as bases, and use the left trigger and the D-pad to create control units for easier management. You can also hit the right bumper one time, which selects everyone in the local area, while hitting it twice selects everyone on the map. Double pressing on a single unit selects all their unit types, and of course you can just sort of draw your control over everybody by hitting A and dragging across the screen. The real issue here though, isn't any of that, it's friggin' fidelity. While it's been pared down to fit and work really well on a controller, the fact is, when the battle turns into a pitched war, who the hell wants to fight with the controls? And you do find yourself doing it, and the requirement to return to bases means leaving units fighting alone without oversight, and more importantly, leader powers, which can be the difference between life and death. Now, those leader powers themselves let you basically play as a god of war, dropping turrets into the heat of battle, rocket bombardments, and healing drones if you have the energy. But bouncing back to your base never felt exactly right, as you can be gone for less than 15 seconds, create more units at your base, you return, and for some reason unknown to you, normal marines are standing face to face with a tank, ignoring the near by buildings they can entrench themselves in for defensive bonuses and not using their special upgrades that you gave them. It's like someone saving all their bullets in a first person shooter. If you're dead, you just have a bunch of ammo and you died heavier. Now, luckily with the PC, you of course have mouse and keyboard controls, which will up that fidelity a great deal and it's something to be aware of. When you play the game, there's also various different multiplayers. A list where I think anybody with RTS experience will identify things like deathmatch and base building races, but there's actually some other modes in here that are very interesting. And a person who likes multiplayer can absolutely get lost in here with all manner of options across the board, including skulls to augment gameplay. There's a tremendous amount available. And for once, this is one of the few multiplayer RTS games I can think of where I actually liked every map for one reason or another. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't some issues with some or some don't flow a little better than others, but overall, I was actually quite happy with their quality. Now, of course, anybody following this game knows there's a blitz mode, which replaces building bases with a collectible card deck mechanic, with cards costing some amount of energy to use and that raising as they grow in power, all of which can be played against AI or other players. Sadly, no crossplay. Now, in blitz mode, each leader can make a deck from a large number of generic cards, but there are also specific cards that are tied to that leader, as well as rare and legendary cards, of course, that might be the difference from a Warthog driving into a skirmish and getting just hot smoked before doing any damage, to that same Warthog riding in and once it gets shot, humans leaping off and basically continuing to fight like nothing happened. The issue here, guys, is you can buy the card backs. Yes, you can unlock them as you progress in the game, and unlocking packs will get you rare and special cards for specific leaders. It just feels messy and far too close to pay to win, especially with the cards leveling up if you get duplicates. And one way to get duplicates is to just buy more packs. Really, no matter which way you slice it, folks, buying cards is gonna have some kind of advantage, at least at the start, like it or hate it, it's there. And I honestly don't like it at all. I mean, we can all argue about the specifics of pay to win games, but no matter how many ways a company wants to ride the gray line between grift and gift, in the end, I just don't like the way this feels. Now, that being said, one nice thing about it is it is not in any other version of the game. All the multiplayer and stuff doesn't have that. It's just blitz mode. 
Lastly, I have to say that when a game like this is really working well and you're facing off against upgraded marines and weaponized air vehicles all looking for bad guy blood, it's actually really enjoyable. And the AI love to attack my flanks, which I actually enjoyed. I'm a bit tentative when it comes to forward bases in this game because they're so good at flanking. I love that feeling that you're never actually sure of what the AI will do. And that happened here on normal and higher difficulties. Of course, speaking about difficulties, going to have us talk a little bit about some of the bugs. Because listen, there are probably more bugs here than an Amsterdam bedspread. I mean, check this out right here. No, that's not a futuristic Sturgis rally. That's actually the result of the game deciding that one of the goals was impossible to destroy for the enemy, even though all my forces were dead. But the enemy couldn't win, so after waiting in place for 20 minutes, I won regardless of having no bases, no playable units on screen, and the game's AI spawning endless numbers of enemies. Now, this happened a number of times. Additionally, the game's maps are a trip hazard of issues at times, with cars falling off cliffs and stalling progress in missions, to main characters dying and you being told to revive them, but they just died on the edge of the screen that you can't get close enough to actually revive them. I mean, what sucks the most here is that this is actually more than competent and at times wonderfully playable. It's a game with some unique and enjoyable counterplays as well and some design ideas, but it's held down by a number of technical issues. Fun factor. So while the core gameplay is fun, it totally is. And the game offers a large number of modes, well over 10 hours of campaign missions, co-op and other ways to enjoy the Halo universe while basically just playing with digital toys. The bugs overshadowed a lot of the excellent design decisions that we see here. For example, I love the push-pull of things like the combat exhaustion, which is basically if you spawn somebody in the middle of the battlefield, then they basically have lower hit points and they have to wait a little bit before that raises back up. There's a lot of push-pull here that I really enjoyed. Do you spend a little bit more and you get that super powerful, slightly offensive and defensive character, or do you get the same version but a little less, but you get them faster? That cycle of buy, 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 die, die, die is actually really well done here. So as always, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch again rating scale. This is actually a deep, deep sale or rent. I'm not saying that you can't have some excellent times in Halo Wars 2, but I did find that the campaign was just so-so. And goddamned, if it's not going to be spoiled by a number of technical issues that really are best left to betas and certainly not finished products. So as always, if you like the video, give it a thumbs up. Maybe check out Twitter or Patreon. If you dislike the video, give it a thumbs down. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.